make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus You silence fear Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus
Good morning, everyone. What I know. So if you remember, two weeks ago, Pastor John did a sermon on what now? Now that resurrection has occurred, where do we go to? What do we do? Last week, he was supposed to do who now? (laughs) But he changed it on me, (laughs) as I found out during the week. So I've had to change mine a little bit, but that's all right. It still works. He also mentioned last week that um, it's interesting how the Holy Spirit always seems to move in and do things behind the scenes. You'll notice as I go through this, there's a couple of key phrases and points that are going to come out, and they've been throughout the service so far. And it, it, it always blows me away how this always happens. It's not an occasional thing. It always happens. And I tell you now, there is no collaboration between any of us. It just happens. It's amazing. It really is. But last week, I believe Pastor John mentioned, as Jesus was appearing in many places, he presented himself to his apostles, or the disciples, later be known as the apostles, and would show them his disfigurement as proof. John 20, it's recorded. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my, side, uh, see my hands? Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, and there's another version that says he fell to the ground and said to him, my Lord, my God. Finally, the penny had dropped for him. Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. And blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We started talking about it. And you can take a couple of different things out of that. But how do we believe when there's no reason to believe? What's really interesting is that from that point on, Thomas didn't doubt. He wasn't doubting Thomas anymore. He was believing Thomas. And the real irony is, is that he put his finger into Jesus' side because he didn't believe. But he then died by a spear to his side because he did believe. Tuesday was Anzac Day. And I can tell you now that through my time in the army, I've seen the best and the worst of people. I've seen great joys and excitement, but I've seen sorrow and pain. And it seems to be that it's when we're in those times of sorrow and pain that we go back to the things that we've learned in those good times. The best way to prepare yourself for when tragic is going to hit is to be prepared. As we were planning on going over to Afghanistan, we had a, um, a padre, a chaplain, and he was asked to talk to us about the things that we were going to see and what was going to happen to get us prepared. And he sat us down and he made us get together in little groups and talk. He only had a couple of questions. The first one was, what were you willing to do? The next one was, what were you willing to die for? And the last one, and probably the most important, was, what were you willing to kill for? Because it's quite easy to have that conversation now. But when you're looking down the barrel of a gun... There's no time to think. Fight or flight. If you freeze, you're already dead. That's why, instinctively, every soldier that's ever been will hear the words contact. And instantaneously, they know that the action is 
run, down, crawl, roll, observe, aim, fire, target instigation. It's built in instinctively so that they know exactly what to do and when to do it, how to do it. My wife and I, being in the army, had to have those discussions. We had to discuss what it would mean if for some reason I wasn't coming home. What were we willing to do? What were we going to sacrifice? What was the price that we were going to pay as a family? And it's that prior preparation that prepared us for when the worst did hit us. Peter told us to always revere Christ as Lord, but always be prepared. Always be prepared in the good times and the bad to give the reason for the hope that you have, but to do it with gentleness and respect. Prior preparation prevents poor performance. So the question is, how can we know? I've stood up here countless times. I'm going to talk about different things, different proofs. You don't even need the Bible to, use, to do these proofs. Because God gave us two books. He gave us his word, the Bible, but he also gave us nature, everything that's around us. You see, uh-oh. Look that way. <laughs> He's given us logical minds. And he even said to Isaiah, come, let us discuss these things. Let us work it out. Let us think. So we have the Callum cosmological argument. And if you remember, I've spoken about that one before. That's quite simply that everything that has a beginning had something that caused that beginning that's both greater and outside of it. We know through science that space and time had a beginning. Everything that exists had a beginning, be it using the Big Bang Theory, or if you want to, you can use thermodynamics, which basically says that everything is slowly deteriorating to nothing. If things lasted forever, then it would have already been deteriorated and we wouldn't be here. It's all right. Just take my word for it. But because everything had a beginning, there had to be something that was spaceless, timeless, personal, because it decided to make it happen, and all-powerful. What can you describe that said, that's that? God. Done. That's pretty... Yeah. All right. Then we've got the ontological. So quite... A witty atheist would go, oh, yeah, yeah, but you see, you haven't heard about this guy named Hawkins. He talks about multiverses, and one of those multiverses created our universe. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Let's go down that line. So what is a multiverse? What is the theory behind a multiverse? The multiverse is that there's multiple universes, each of which has every possible living scenario in it. Ah, oh, that's interesting. So is it possible that in one of these universes that there is a being that is all-powerful, personal, timeless, spaceless, and omnipresent? Yeah? Okay, so if it's omnipresent, that means that it's everywhere, correct? Yeah. So that means it's here, correct? Ah. So God has to exist if you're going to go down the multiverse line. But I don't want to believe that. That means I have to follow rules. Rules? Really? You say rules? Well, what about the moral argument? Is there objective goodness? You see, to an atheist, they can't actually say that anything that happens is good or bad because an atheist has no choice. To an atheist, we're just a random chemical reaction happening that started off from the Big Bang and has been developing through. To an atheist, strictly speaking, he can't explain that Hitler is wrong. 
He can't explain that Stalin was wrong to kill 20 million of his own people. There's no grounds for it. But yet we all know, in our heart, the law. Someone doesn't wake up in the morning and decide to go kill someone. They have to work their way up to it. Because in your heart, you know that it's wrong. Well, because I'm an atheist, does that mean I can't know good or wrong? No, that doesn't mean you don't. It just means that you've got no reason for it. And if we have a look throughout history, some horrible, horrible things were done under the guise of religion. Don't get me wrong. But I tell you now, the 20th century is the first century that had atheist dictators running countries and it is the bloodiest century in all of history. In fact, more people died for political reasons in the 20th century than people died throughout the whole of history. What about the big things? Let's have a look at the fine tuning of the universe. There is only one who can stretch the heavens. Written some 4,000 years ago, it is talking about the universe expanding and constantly expanding. Astrophysicists have worked out that if that speed was to change by one, in one to the power of 10, to the power of 55, that is, if that one, the ratio one, was an atom, more than all the atoms in the entire universe, that's how much of a difference it is, that's that minute little bit, the whole universe would implode or would just disintegrate, gone. There'd be nothing. That is how fine-tuned everything is. What about the small things? You know, the nuclear physicists, they say that if you change an atom's nuclear hold on itself, the thing that holds it all together, which they still can't work out what's doing it, but if that changes by less than 1%, the entire universe would erupt in nuclear explosions as we all just disintegrate into nothing. But you see, there's people that go, oh, that just happened to be. Just that happened? I'll tell you what, I do not have enough faith to be an atheist. We're back. Oi, that's too far. Technology, eh? (laughs) But these arguments are all good and well. When we're sitting here quite content and happy, we can have these discussions and it doesn't matter. But when things start to go wrong, that's when doubt creeps in. And behold, the adversary is like a prying lion. He creeps through the wilderness like a lion and he waits for that one. And then he goes for you. He goes straight for your jugular. He's taking you down. You're not getting away from that. C.S. Lewis in a time of grief as his wife passed away, wrote, Meanwhile, where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all help is in vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face, the sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. If we be honest with ourselves, at one stage or another, we've all felt that doubt. That doubt. There's an old story about a man walking along the seashore with Jesus and he looks back and every single time he had problems, every time life was getting tough, there was only one set of footprints. And he looked at Jesus and said, where were you? I can tell you 
one Wednesday night was the loneliest night that I had ever been in. And I walked through the halls of a hospital with just a random beep, beep. And there was no one, not a thing, no one. I was on my own. And I cried out because there was no one. All hope was gone. See, no one said it was going to be easy. Jesus told his disciples that the world will hate you and the world being everything in it because you love me. These are the four men who wrote the Gospels. It's the four books that tell us exactly what Jesus did, what he said, and who he was. Matthew, empowered by Halbert in Ethiopia, whilst on the altar, because he pointed out to the king of Ethiopia that it was wrong for him to lust after his niece. Mark was working in Alexandria. They were getting upset because all their religious cults that were providing them money were collapsing around them. So they strung him up, dragged him behind horses until he died. Luke refused to recant the things that he had wrote and the testimonies that he had gathered. Probably in defence of Paul, interesting. So on an olive tree they hung him to dead. And even John, the most beloved, he got to live to an old age. After being exiled and boiled alive, which he miraculously survived. You can't have a discussion about pain and suffering without talking about this guy. I honestly think that out of all the books of the Bible, this is the most amazing and remarkable. It was probably written about 4,000 years ago. That makes it the oldest book of the Bible. It was probably even written before the time of Abraham. I'm giving up on that. If you want the PowerPoint, come see me afterwards. (laughs) Oh, now it is. What's really interesting about it is you lose it in the translations, but it doesn't use the name Yahweh, which means that it wasn't a Hebrew text. The Hebrews probably had it with them when they went to Egypt before the time of Moses. It actually calls God the Almighty, which is even more interesting because we have a look at Genesis prior to Moses and the burning bush. There were other prophets and whatnot around, such as the priest of Melchizedek, who referred to God as the Almighty. So there's a good chance that they were following the religion that they took off the ark with them. They'd been passed down through generation. And Job, he was quite righteous and he followed those same traditions and those same sacrifices and whatnot, giving sacrifice as the patriarch of his family to God as a representative. The book contains five people, all of which can can be found in extra biblical texts ancient stones, rocks, scrolls, and they have the names Elihaz, Baladad, Job, Elihu. What's interesting is that it really digs in and discusses and deals with human emotion and suffering. Now, here's where I don't know if this is going to work. Okay. I have not got time 
to go through the whole book of Job. As much as I'd love to, but I highly, highly recommend that you get your head into it and get reading it. But a word of caution. If you're going to do so, do so with a good, reliable commentary. Because there's parts in it that is wrong. Say again, there's parts in it that is wrong. And if you use those parts and give people that advice, it's probably not going to work out well. (laughs) So, the highlight reel. Prologue. God's boasting about Job. Can you imagine that? It's a bit of an insight into heaven. There's God, and he's watching all of his people, and in walks in the crafty devil going, ha, 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 I've got another one. And there's God going, yeah, yeah. But have you seen my servant John there? Have you seen the churches he's planting, the people that they're reaching out to? You ain't got nothing, champ. And he's boasting about Job. But you see, the devil tries to be crafty. And he says, that's only because you look after him. He's your favourite. I can't touch him. Things would be different if I could touch him. So God says, no worries. Go for it. Take whatever you want off of him. So he goes down, kills all of his children, Wipes out his cattle, everything. He's now destitute and alone. He's got his wife, the house that he lives in, that's it. I can tell you now, one of the hardest things for me after the passing of my daughter was driving in our van, looking in the rear view mirror and where there was meant to be three babies, there was now one. We had a miscarriage earlier in the year. That's why we got the van. And then there was my daughter who had died. As I said, he's crafty like a lion and he'll go for the jugular. He'll get you where it hurts. But how did Job react to this? Probably one of the most famous sayings that we use all the time. The Lord giveth and he taketh away. May the name of the Lord be praised. The adversary, well, he's still not happy. He says that that's only because he wasn't touched. I'm going to really get him to turn. You need to get something that he cares about. He didn't really care about his family. He only cares about himself. So God allows him to inflict him with pain and disease. Job's wife couldn't take any more. She curses God and wishes Job to be dead. In fact, she tells him, her advice to him is, you should just curse God and die. How many times have you heard people say, I don't believe in God, and if I did, I hate him. I put to you that a lot of people out there that don't believe It's not because of the evidence, it's because of their pain and suffering or that of their friends. As Job said, shall we only accept God for the good and not the trouble? It's if God is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-good, we actually have to give him praise even for the bad stuff. Job then sits on his own in silence and contemplation. Three friends come to sympathise and comfort him. Great friends. No one speaks for seven days because they can see the pain and anguish that he is in. They mourned with him like it was their custom, but no one could currently talk to him. Now we'll speed it up again. So there's three rounds of arguments. And as I said, you really need to go through this with a commentary to really dig out the, 
the real good stuff in there. And there is really, really good stuff in there. In his pain and his suffering, in his anguish, as everyone's pointing the finger at him saying, no, you did something wrong. It was you. It was your sin. It was this. You remember Jesus had something similar happen? Where he was a blind man? And afterwards the disciples said, oh, who was it? Was it him or was it his parents? Who did the sin? What caused this? He said, no. No. That's not what this is about. I had a cousin and she passed away from SIDS. And it just so happened to be that some people came knocking on the door of my aunt's house that day and they gave similar advice. They said that God took that baby away because she was living in sin. To this day, if ever anyone mentions anything about the Bible or Jesus or any of that sort of stuff, she's out of that room. She'll have nothing to do with it. You don't know why these things happen. I would strongly suggest you don't tell people why you think they happened. But in his suffering, Job cries out, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they inscribed with an iron tool on lead and engraved in rock forever. I know my Redeemer lives. And that in the end, he will stand on the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in flesh, I will see God. I will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Isn't that great? In the darkest times when all is going wrong, it is well with his soul because he knows his Redeemer lives. And he will, as well as his family, all come back and live with him again in paradise. Now, it gets me thinking. You know, I, think, I think about when Jesus is there with Lazarus and everyone's crying. Even Jesus is crying. Jesus is upset. And now there's arguments about why he's upset. But I think Jesus was human. I think he was upset that his cousin was dead. They were good friends. They loved each other. Passing is not easy. It's a sad thing. But then I hear Jesus' words. Lazarus, get up and come out. And I imagine on that day when finally I pass and Jesus calls out, Matthew, get up and walk. And I'll enter glory. And I'll see my daughter. I'll see my dad. I'll see all these people that have gone before me. And they will be there with me. And like Lazarus and the community cleaned the stench of death off of him, they will help clean me so that I can be presented to my Lord as clean and white as snow. The story continues. And it comes to an intermission. Where can wisdom be found? We can dig the deepest of mines. We can put people on the moon, but we cannot find wisdom. There's only one who can find wisdom. And the way that we find it is through him. And he himself says that the fear of the Lord, that's wisdom. To shun evil, that's understanding. But now we have a fourth person who decides to prop his head up. And we've all got this person in our lives. Usually it comes in the form of a teenager. You see, nothing beats the wisdom of youth, does it? Nah, you got it all wrong. I'll tell you how it is. Me and my whole 16 years of experience, I know what's what. Is that so, Greta Thunberg? (laughs) Is that so? It's interesting how this 16-year-old is accusing 
my generation and those that have gone before of destroying the planet. These polar bears are on the edge of extinction. We are facing a mass extinction in the next 10 years. I think it was about eight years ago that that came out. So we're getting close. Everything will be destroyed. How dare you? Is that so? That thing in your hand, mobile phone? In my day, you were lucky to have one. In most of your day, you had to go and put money into a machine to get a phone call. Before that, you go down to the post office and they'll touch a button. Or you wrote. So which one's more destructive to the planet? A new phone every year? That's if it's a good phone. Or writing a letter? Who's done more damage? But I dare say that she had people in her ear telling her what to say. I don't think that was her own thoughts and ideas and I have heard that she does have some other issues going on but I'll leave that alone. But possibly that was the same with Elihu. I've heard it from one commentator that it seems that there's a lot of little bits of truth in what he says that is then twisted. Very much so. Like someone whispering in the ear of Jude or Judas saying, you know, we could speed this all up. If we pay the priests or get money from them and tell them that's the Messiah, he's going to have to do something about it, isn't he? Same devil, same old tricks. Careful for that voice in the ear. Make sure you got it tuned to the right one. But you see, God interrupts all this. Who interrupts my plans without knowledge? Who speaks without wisdom? Brace yourself like a man, for I've got questions for you, and you will answer them. I don't know about you, but at that point, I'm on my knees going, I am sorry. I don't know what I've done. I don't know if it was right or wrong, but I'm sorry. God then takes them on a tour of creation. And he shows them some amazing things. Things that have not been revealed to other eyes until the last hundred years. Can you imagine being taken with God down into the depths of the ocean and shown where the wells come from that provides the water? They were shown that. We only discovered these deep water springs in the 1950s. So how on the earth did someone 4,000 years ago know to write that? Just saying. If you go through the book, there is a lot of scientific evidences and proofs in there. And as I said, a lot of them have only been discovered in the last 100 years or so. But still it hurts. God, it hurts. I said, God, it hurts. And God said, I know. I said, God, I cry a lot. And God said, that's why I gave you tears. I said, God, I get so depressed. And God said, that's why I gave you the sunshine. I said, God, I feel alone. And God said, that's why I gave you loved ones. I said, God, my loved one's dead. And God said, yeah, I washed my nail to a cross. I said, God, where are they? And God said, mine's on my right and yours is in the light. I said, God, it hurts. And he said, I know. That night in the hospital when all was lost and there was no one and I cried out. I begged, 
I begged for my daughter to be okay. And I knew at that point the answer was not the one that I wanted. He told me no. I said, I can't do this. I cannot do this. Don't do this to me. In an instant, I relived the last year and a half, everything that had happened, songs that I'd played, conversations I had, emotions I'd felt, everything. It all came to me like that. It's inexplicable. It just, it just happened. And he said, you've got this. I said, okay, well then make it easy on her. The next day, she opened her eyes and as you would do, being less than 18 months with tubes and everything coming out of you, she was in a panic. And I looked her straight in the eye and I said, it'll be all right. She closed her eyes and never opened them again. You see, the really interesting thing about Job is that it doesn't answer that question. It's an age-old question. If God is such a loving God, why do we have pain and suffering? Why do we have to go through it? Instead, what he did is he showed them creation. We don't understand it, but did you realise that if we didn't have the exact amount of rain that we have globally, our nitrogen levels would deplete? which would cause the oxygen levels to increase, which would cause many things to spontaneously combust. And we all know what happens if it rains too much. Bad things happen, they happen for a reason, it's not our, re it's not our job to know about it. But if you listen, observe, God will show you that there's still life. The morning before we turned off Aurora's life support, I had to get out of the room. I just needed some fresh air. The hospital had a cafe and we went down there. And it was our blessing and privilege to meet this little girl. She would have been about the same age. And her family were travelling in Thailand. And she got meningococcal. Now this is a disease that will eat your limbs. And it had started on her. Thailand, their rule of thumb is, just take them all and hope for the best. They wanted to cut off both of her legs and both of her arms. Her mum and dad fought and fought and refused. They managed to get her shipped over to Taiwan and they were doing work there, and they managed to save her limbs. She then came back to Australia, and she, on that day, was having her last lot of plastic surgery. And if we hadn't been told that that was that little girl, we wouldn't have known. God still gives us miracles. I then took my lunch, or breakfast, or whatever it was, and I crossed the road. There was a little seedy area there, and I sat there. And I just wanted to go through my thoughts and enjoy my food. And this cute little magpie came up and sat next to me. And he enjoyed my food with me. Even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, I know that you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You see, 
If the first verse in the Bible is true, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That means the rest of the Bible is true. So that means that in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth through his word. The word that visited Abraham in the wilderness and promised to him that his line would bear the saviour of the world. That all nations would turn to his children. The same word that became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. The same word that came not to condemn us, but to give us life. If he is that powerful, then Paul was true. I can do all things through him that strengthens me. So what's my conclusion? We need to prepare. We need to prepare to have those conversations with the people that are hurting. Because they're the hardest ones. And they're the ones that we're going to get more and more. We're heading for dark times. We have been for a long time, but it is getting worse. And that's not to say that he's coming tomorrow. It'd be nice. But it's not for me to know. That's for the Father and the Father alone. We have a job to do while we're here. And that's to present the good news to all those And we do it with gentleness and respect, even more so for those that are hurting. Just sharing a story makes people ask a question. When they ask you, why do you believe? Just tell them why. Be open. If he doesn't condemn you, how can they? He loves you so much. I'm about to play a song. And in my mind, it's one of the most beautiful songs recently released. And it shows how God has gone throughout creation doing all these things. And when the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar his praises, so will I. If the wind goes where he'll send it, then so will I. And I'll sing his praises a hundred billion times. God bless you all. God of creation There at the start Before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of life And as you speak A hundred billion guys Sees a boy in the vapor of your breath, the planets fall. And if the stars amaze and worship so alive, I can see your heart in everything you make, every burning star, signal fire. And if creation sings your praises, so will I God of your promise, you don't speak in vain Spoken on nature and science, follow the signs.
sound of your voice When as you speak A hundred billion creatures catch your breath Evolving in pursuit of what you Good amount to your 